Hey everyone, um, Miss Maples. I decided that I would make a quick video of um, me reading and analyzing the Hillby climb. So if you're struggling, if you need help with your annotations, if you missed class, you can refer to this video and I'll try to go quickly. Um, please remember that I have linked in the different types of figurative language, sound devices, and structure if you need to review what those are. You learned them yesterday, or not yesterday, last week when you learned tip fast. So I'm gonna read aloud the poem and go over my annotations. Okay. The hill we climb. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade, We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace and the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. So she's starting out with the question and she's using symbolism, okay? She's saying um, light as a symbol of good, truth, shade as difficult times like we've been in in our country um, in this past year or so, that we feel like we're wading a sea. This is a metaphor. She's comparing our struggles in this country to trying to wade through the ocean, like how hard that would be. Um, she says that we've braved the belly of the beast, which is a biblical allusion. She's making a shout out to a Bible story. Okay. Um, in the Bible, there's a story of Jonah being swallowed by a giant fish, but he survives it. The fish spits him back up. So she's saying, we've gotten through a lot in this country. We've had some fish swallow us, and we have fought our way back out. Um, and then she points out that being quiet, even though quiet and peace, we often think of those words as synonyms, as meaning the same thing. In a way, they aren't, right? Right. Peace and quiet, they don't always match. Sometimes we have to make noise in order to create peace. We have to fight against what just is to create justice. Because what just is isn't always the right thing, right? She says the dawn is ours. Dawn is symbolic of a new day, a new chance, right? Um. And yet the dawn is ours. Before we knew it, somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. So I want to point out she uses um, lots of weathered and witnessed. That is alliteration. Okay. That wa wa repeated. So alliteration. Here she's referencing her own life. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. She has said that she's always dreamed of being president and here she is reciting at President Biden's inauguration. Um, when she says we over and over, you guys, she's referring to Americans. That's who she is addressing in her poem. That is her audience, all Americans. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge a union with purpose. She has some more alliteration with the p, p, p right? Um, she also uses rhyme, although she doesn't have a rhyme scheme where you can mark A, B, A, B. She doesn't have a rhyme scheme in this poem. She does use rhyme. This is something that rappers do a lot and spoken word poetry like she's doing does it a lot where she says stuff like pristine, but that doesn't mean she creates rhyme right there. So just pay attention to those moments. And when you're analyzing the poem, Later, when you do your tip fast analysis, you can write that, that she has lots of rhyme throughout the poem, but not in a, a strict rhyme scheme like we saw in Nothing Gold Can Stay by Robert Frost. 
um, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. So she uses strong alliteration. I think she uses the k sound with the C seven times right there. And she's pointing out that Let's be purposeful. We're never going to be perfect, but let's create a country where we actually are committed to everyone, where we actually do strive for peace and justice for everyone. And so we lift our gazes to not what stands between us, but what stands before us. Lift our gaze, she means metaphorically. She's not literally talking about our eyes, but our focus. Let's put our focus on not how we're different, right? But what stands before us, what we need to do in our future to make this country better. We must close the divide because we know to put our future first, we must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried, that we'll forever be tied together victorious, not because we'll never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. I just love the way she writes. I love the rhythm she creates with her words, her sound devices, her figurative language with her symbolism and her comparisons. She's awesome, my personal opinion. She's saying lay down our arms, our weapons. Okay, that's what she means when she says lay down our arms and reach out our arms. Let's put aside our fighting and let's instead try to create unity. So she's creating a metaphor there and she's using those symbolically. So when you guys are doing your analysis, you can write that. Um, she's using great alliteration, grieved, grew, hurt, hoped, tired, tried. We might be having a hard time, but we're still trying to move forward is what she's kind of creating there. And she points out that we will have more defeats in this country, but she's saying, let us not sow division anymore. Sow division means to create divide in our country, right? Create fighting, create us versus them. That's what she's saying she wants to move away from. And you guys will see, I have so much, so many notes that, I'm saying things, but you can't see them on the side. So as I go through this video, you'll see all my notes. Um, let me go back. Okay, so she does another biblical illusion right here. Scripture tells us to envision, and she also has some rhyme going on, that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree and no one shall make them afraid. So here she's saying that she's referring to a biblical uh, discussion, a biblical, a piece of the Bible that says that um, someday when we're older, we'll get to sit under our own fig tree and not be afraid, right? But if we want to have that in our future, we got to work for it. So she's saying if we're to live up to our own time, if that's what we want, the victory won't lie in the blade, but in the bridges we made. She's using blade and bridges symbolically. Blade as in fighting, disunity, war. Bridges as in harmony, connection, bonds, right? We're not going to win by fighting. We're going to win by unity. This is the promise to glade the hill we climb. So she's saying, this is what we got to work for. This is the hill we're climbing. Hopefully we'll get to a glade. A glade is like a meadow that's a lot more calm than this hill we're climbing. If only we dare, it's because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it, would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, 
it can never be permanently defeated. Lines 55 to 60, she is referring to the attack that happened at the Capitol just not long before her, her reciting this poem, right? <clears throat> so she's actually talking about a current event, recent history, right? In this truth, in this faith we trust, for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. We create our history. What we do in these moments are gonna be recorded <laughs> and future generations are gonna look at it. This is also right here, history has its eyes on us. This is another allusion, another reference. She's alluding to not the Bible this time, but the play Hamilton, the musical Hamilton, because this line is repeated over and over in that play. So she's like, shout out to Hamilton right now. This is the era of redemption. We feared at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour. She has great internal rhyme. That's what this is right here. Um, redemption. We feared its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs. You guys probably, like, this is where it sounds like rap, right? This is what rappers do, create that internal rhyme and rhythm. That's what she's doing right here, okay? She does not have a rhyme scheme in this poem where the ends all go A, B, C, D, right? She doesn't have that. She has internal rhyme with her lines and some end rhyme, but not a, not a clear pattern. <clears throat> we did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it, we found the power to author a new chapter. That's a, a metaphor. We're not literally authoring a new chapter, but we are <clears throat> writing how things are going to turn out. That's what she's saying right there. To offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So while we once asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? We have all felt like we're never going to prevail over all the catastrophes around us. She's saying, now we assert how could catastrophe prevail over us? She's saying like, she's kind of be empowering here. We will prevail. We will get through this. Okay. We will not march back to what was metaphorically, but move to what shall be. We're moving forward. And this is what her vision is. A country that is bruised, but whole, benevolent, but bold, great alliteration, and also benevolent means good. We're good and bold. Fierce and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Great repetition, great alliteration with that I sound, right? Interrupted, intimidation, inaction, inertia, inheritance. If we don't act if we don't move, inertia means not moving. All of the problems we will just pass down to the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens. For one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So she's saying it, if we don't fix our blunders, it becomes our children's burdens. Instead, we need to merge mercy with might and might with right and do the right thing so that we give our children love as the legacy and we give them change instead of giving them problems. Okay. So now she's asking. She's saying, this is what we need to do, everyone. So let us leave behind a country better than the one where we, the one we were left with, right? Every breath from my bronze pounded chest. So she's refer referring to herself. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold limbed hills of the West. That's us. We're on the West of this country. We will rise from the windswept Northeast. Where our forefathers first realized revolution. The East Coast, right? Where our country began. 
We will rise from the lake-rimmed cities of the Midwestern states, the middle of our country. We will rise from the sun-baked south of our country. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover. And every known nook of our nation and every corner called our country, great alliteration, our people diverse and beautiful will emerge, battered and beautiful. Again, so many great sound devices going on here. <clears throat> when So she at the beginning of the poem, remember, she said, when day comes, we ask ourselves, how will we find light in this never-ending shade? Here she answers her question. She posed a question at the beginning. She answers it at the end. When day comes, we step out of the shade. A flame, we're on fire, symbolically, and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. She's saying, we don't wait for a new dawn. We don't wait for a new time. We free it. We create it. For there is always light if we're brave enough to see it, if we are brave enough to be it. So she's saying, there is always going to be light and goodness, but we have to be brave enough to go find it and to be that light. We have to be our own change, right? So again, light symbolic of goodness, of the kind of country we want. Let's step out of the shade and create it, is what she's saying. I hope that that kind of helped you understand the poem if you were struggling. And going through this was hopefully helpful. Um, and then start on this. I'll give you guys a little more time in class tomorrow, Tuesday. But for your week five response tables, your Monday response table is for you to go through and do a tip fast analysis of this poem. So remember, to, you mark connotation of the title to begin. So the is neutral. There's no feeling to the. Hill, well, symbolically a hill is something we have to do that's difficult. So I'm going to put negative. We, I think you could put neutral or positive. Positive because it's unity, but it's also just kind of a neutral word. And climb, I'm going to say negative. You might have this a little differently than me, the way that you interpret the connotations of these words. But when I read the hill we climb, overall, that is kind of a more negative title. If someone was like, hey, you got a hill to climb, I'd be like, really? You know, I know you've already read the poem, but just based on the title, what would you expect this to be about? Maybe something like this poem will be about all of the struggles we must go through in this country because she's saying this at the presidential inauguration. For paraphrase, kind of in your own words, what is this poem about? Um, I'm going to say this poem is about the struggles we have gone through, are going through in this country, and a call out to all people to be the light and to stop our fighting work together. Okay, so I helped you guys a lot with the figurative language when I went through all of that. Um, Important words from the hill we climb. For this part, I want you to go find some words that really stood out to you. She uses light a lot. She uses shade a lot. And then go find some of your own. And then you're going to mark the connotation of the words. Light has a positive connotation. That's a the way that she's using it. It's a positive thing. Shade has a negative connotation. So then you go through and find some more words that you think are important in the poem and mark their connotation, okay? 
Is the diction formal or informal? Um, she's formal. She speaks academically. There's no slang. But it's not super fancy. She wanted to create a poem that she thought most Americans could understand, right? All right, remember imagery is when you can really visualize something. Go find some imagery, copy and paste it. Tell me why it's imagery. Go find a metaphor or a simile. There's lots of metaphors in this poem. I don't remember seeing a simile. I think she usually, she uses metaphors. Um, copy and paste it. Tell me how it's a metaphor, how it's a comparison. Um, go find personification, a time where she creates, she describes something as human. Like when she describes America as bruised. America doesn't bruise. It's not a person, right? That's personification. Um, symbols, tons of symbols, light, shade, um, blade, bridge, all of those were symbolic. Illusion. I pointed out there was the allusion to the Bible with the belly of the beast, Jonah being swallowed by the giant fish. There was the allusion to the Bible with we must sit under our own vine and fig tree and no one will make us afraid. That comes from the Bible. Um, and then she alludes to the play Hamilton when she says history has its eyes on us because that line history has its eyes on us or on you or on me is a is throughout the play Hamilton. Alliteration, tons of alliteration, that repetition of the first sound, right? Um, assonance and consonants is internal repetition. There's lots of that too. You can certainly choose to focus on that. And then remember for um, rhyme, uh, she, she uses lots of rhyme, but there is no rhyme scheme. So just... You can note that she uses rhyme, but no rhyme scheme. This is not going to be the exact same for everybody, and that is okay. Um, but I just want to be able to see your thinking and see that you're understanding how to break apart a poem. You're understanding what it what connotation means. You're understanding what these types of figurative language means. You know what rhyme means. You kind of are understanding how to break this down. I'm just going to scroll over my annotations again, if that's helpful to anyone. And I'll go ahead and end this video. Um, hopefully this was a helpful reference for you. Bye, everybody.